How did a mayor's wife come to encounter every possible outcome of a heresy trial in medieval England? Alice Rowley is the topic of this week's Footnoting History. Hi, I'm Kirsty, and welcome to the March 16th edition of Footnoting History. Alice Rowley, by all appearances, was a pillar of the Coventry community around the turn of the 16th century. Her husband, William, was a draper and served as mayor of the city from 1491 to 1492. The couple was part of the political elite of the city and earned a comfortable living. Although it had begun to lose business by the 15th century, Coventry had been famous throughout the medieval period for the quality of its wool. The Rowleys, as cloth merchants, were at the top of an admittedly declining citywide industry, but they benefited both politically and materially from their standing in the freedom of the city. By 1511, she was a widow operating her late husband's trade, and her son was beginning a political career of his own. Her own evidence indicates that she visited her friends and received guests fairly often. She was a popular woman. How, then, did she find herself in the bishop's court at Maxstone Priory in October of 1511 facing charges of heresy? To answer that question, we have to go back over a hundred years to a man by the name of John Wycliffe, who lived from 1330 to 1384. He was a scholar at Oxford University, and his opinion about the church and how it should be run raised a lot of eyebrows. Among other things, he felt that the church should be poor and that secular authorities should assist it in remaining so. This wasn't very good for getting him friends in the church, but it did help him get the protection of John of Gaunt, who was the king's brother and later the king's uncle. He argued against the ordination of priests and also pushed for the Bible as the sole authority for Christian belief. He was also heavily involved in the first translation of the Vulgate Bible into English, which was published around 1382 with updates over the next decade or so. The church had a lot of trouble with what he was saying, but his political connections managed to protect him during his lifetime, and he was only fully condemned as a heretic in 1415, almost 30 years after his death. But what does this have to do with Mrs. Rowley? It turns out that a lot of people actually agreed with at least some of what John Wycliffe was saying, and for the first time, England found itself with a very real heresy problem. As his ideas spread across England, his followers became known as Lollard, but they didn't necessarily stay very close to what Wycliffe originally said. As a matter of fact, they didn't even necessarily stick with what other groups of Lollards said. Common themes that emerged would be anti-clericalism, uh, issues with pilgrimage, and even iconoclasm. However, there is some indication that the community was unusually literate, and some even pushed for female leadership. Obviously, this was a huge issue for the church. Now, by this point, the process of Inquisition had had a couple of centuries to grow and mature on the continent, and England had never had to use it, at least for heresy. The official English response, then, was actually not to bring in an external inquisitor, as had been done in France and other regions that had encountered issues of this sort, but rather to take these cases and assign them to the local bishop. The theoretical basis for prosecution of heresy in church courts using inquisitorial procedure actually began in 1184 with the decretal ad abolendum, which was issued by Pope Lucius III. In this document, the steps to investigate heresy and treat it as an occult crime were very clearly defined. A heresy case presented in church courts could go in one of three directions. If the accused maintained innocence and could produce a number of trustworthy individuals that could attest to their orthodoxy, an inquisitor could opt to allow a simple act of compurgation. If a person couldn't produce those compurgators, or the charges were more severe, then he or she had the option to confess to and abjure any heretical proposition. In order to convict a heretic, a confession was essential. At this point, the bishop could assign a penance at his discretion, which often correlated to the nature and the severity of the abjured belief. Without a confession, the trial could stall for an extended period of time while the accused individual remained in prison. These two procedures, that is, abjuration and compurgation, form the great majority of recorded heresy cases. Only two situations could lead the inquisitor to turn a suspected heretic over to the lay courts for capital punishment the refusal to abjure after confession, or a relapse into heresy following abjuration. The euphemistic relaxation to the secular arm was implemented only in rare cases and shouldn't be considered the norm for proceedings against heresy, though it did happen. In the Coventry trials of 1511 and 1512, only one of the 49 abjured heretics met this fate. Her name was Joan Ward, uh, alias Washingburn. We'll hear more about her later. 
Compurgation, then, is the least disruptive procedure by which an accused heretic could clear his or her name. Between 1428 and 1431, 15 cases of compurgation appear in the Diocese of Norwich under Bishop William Annick. The relative lack of compurgations elsewhere may be a matter of procedure or a deficiency in documentation, as we see in the case of Alice Rowley. The only evidence of her previous interaction with the court lies in her abjuration. The bishop could set the number of compurgators as he saw fit. Seven seems to reflect a moderate level of evidence or suspicion against the accused. If the alleged heretics successfully defended their bona fama, then they were free to go, and the procedure would not be considered a precedent for future prosecutions against the same individual. Alice Rowley produced 16 compurgators. This may indicate either very strong evidence against her or an overzealous recruiting strategy. It seems most bishops did not necessarily record all of the compurgations that come in front of them. Instead, most case records document confession, penance, and an oath to reject heresy upon pain of death. Ultimately, these were the most important portions of the entire process. Since the relapse into heresy held a much stiffer penalty, that is, death, establishing precedent remained a priority. Public penance served not only as a show of humility for the abjured heretic, it also fixed the crime, its perpetrators, and its penalty in the mind of all parishioners. Essentially, as the historian Ian Forrest observes, the entire community became witnesses to the oath of abjuration and so held a common obligation to report any relapses to the appropriate authorities. While the possibility of a death sentence was an important fact in the legal proceedings for heterodoxy, it remained for the most part a threat used by bishops to encourage errant believers to return to the fold and prevent others from straying. Alice Rowley, therefore, presented a tangible threat to the system of heretical detection that Bishop Geoffrey Blythe had in place. The community had gone to great lengths to protect her from punishment, though she later explained that she had maintained heretical communications with large numbers of people. Throughout the proceedings that are recorded in a very small paper book called the Litchfield Court Book, Blythe shows a strong interest in the network of heretics in his diocese of Litchfield and Coventry. Was he trying to crack a dedicated group of people who were learning how to counter the legal system? While he did not ignore the books and heresies held by these individuals, lists of denouncements make up a large portion of the text. Rowley alone identified over 40 individuals in her testimony. Rowley appeared before the bishop four times, on October 31st and November 5th of 1511, and the 16th and 24th of January in 1512. The first session confirmed that she had been suspected of heresy before, and the second includes a lengthy discussion of the heretics with whom she had interacted, contacts she'd denied in October. On January 16th, she confessed and agreed to abjure her heresy, and on the 24th, she and eight others formally signed an abjuration and received their penance. This is the point in time where legal process met the bishop's personal judgment concerning the pastoral care of his diocese, and Blythe seized the opportunity. Her penance reflected her liminal status between abjured and relapsed heretic, where due process could not. Blythe instructed her to carry a bundle of wood while watching all the time while Joan Washingburn is being burnt, and then offer twelve pence to an image of Mary. Twelve pence was a steep fine, and her presence at Washingburn's death was designed to emphasize how close Rowley had come to the end. This also reflects some of the Lollard beliefs that she had abjured, in that she had to give this money to, specifically, an image of Mary. But what of Joan Washingburn, then? Because the clergy could not shed blood or take life, relapsed heretics were relaxed to the secular arm, a euphemism for the involvement of royal courts for execution. The expected method was burning at the stake. This punishment appears both on the continent and in England. In this way, the cooperation of the secular authorities was absolutely essential to the inquisitorial process. This was allowed by Parliament's passage of the Statute de Heretico Comburendo in 1401, which confirmed the state's role in the execution of relapsed heretics convicted by the church courts. Even before any statutes passed through Parliament, however, the expectations of canon law influenced the secular response to the issue of heretical relapse. Parliamentary action merely confirmed and streamlined an existing procedure. Blythe condemned only Joan Ward, and that after four court sessions. The first two include her confession, including the admission that she had previously abjured heresy in Maidstone 16 years beforehand, and that she had performed acts of public penance at that time. In addition, the letter H had been branded onto her cheek as a permanent record of the crime. A penance, I might note, that I haven't seen in any other case, but clearly marks on the body that this person has gone through this process. At the third hearing, on March 11, 1512, the charges were read and Joan admitted that they were true. 
The following day, Blythe read the sentence. We relinquish you henceforth as a relapsed heretic to the secular arm for punishment, asking, and sincerely hoping that by the example that is to be made against you, the trial of death may be moderated in such a way that rigor is not the rule and gentleness is not abandoned. The sentence, as the records note, was carried out on the following Monday, March 15th. Beware the Ides of March. We can assume that Alice Rowley also completed her penance at the same time, completing her whirlwind tour of inquisitional procedure and legal theory. Interestingly, Rowley herself received her penance to watch Joan's death three months before Ward herself was condemned. Alice Rowley's penance was not unique, though. William Warham, the Archbishop of Canterbury from 1503 to 1532, had assigned a similar penance to seven heretics earlier in the year. This harsh judgment touched both on her pride as a member of the social elite and the inherent fear of watching one close to her die a painful death for a crime she too had committed. Rowley had been spared by a legal loophole, and Blythe made certain she and the rest of Coventry understood that. By placing Rowley on public display, he effectively showed that the heretical community had not been able to protect her, despite all of her wealth and privilege. It was a powerful message aimed both at Rowley herself and the assembled parishioners that heresy would not be tolerated. The dramatic conclusion of a relapsed heretic's trial, the relaxation to the secular arm and the public execution by fire, served not only as a penance for the convicted heretic, but also as a highly visible reminder and warning of the dangers of heterodox thought. Bishops did not hesitate to incorporate this fear into their lesser proceedings, as Blythe did when assigning a penance to Rowley, but their goal was to reconcile the individual with the orthodox community, not sentence him or her to death. In a way, relaxation was as much a failure on the part of the local clergy as on the individual sentenced to death. Geoffrey Blythe faced a large, interconnected heretical community over the course of the trials of 1511 and 1512. His response to this challenge had to be harsh because the network had been permitted to grow in relatively unchecked fashion for years. Given the number of people involved, it's surprising that only one person died. Despite centuries of sensationalism, the goal of the Inquisition into heretical depravity was not to enforce orthodox thought by means of violence, nor was there a unified, dedicated Inquisition with a capital I within England, even in response to lollardry. This does not mean that there were not serious consequences for heterodoxy, as Rowley discovered. In fact, the political climate of the late 14th century well into the 16th century encouraged the complete eradication of Lollard thought, especially as authorities perceived an increase of heretical involvement in national politics and sedition, particularly the Peasants' Revolt. Available records, however, show that most trials were handled without any public outcry and that the aim of the process was to educate both the accused and the community concerning the error. Of course, the Lollards did get the last laugh. Their sect was never fully eradicated and, in fact, managed to inform quite a bit of the Reformation in England. This has been Footnoting History. If you liked our podcast, be sure to check us out on the web at footnotinghistory.com where you can find links to our Facebook page and Twitter feed, as well as information about upcoming podcasts. Join us next week, when we'll be talking about drinking and tavern culture in medieval England. Until then, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. See you next week!